Welcome to the first episode of season three of the Ubuntu UK podcast. Yay! It's Monday the 15th, thanks Dave, it's Monday the 15th <laughs> of February 2010, and in this episode we are going to talk about the Read Write Web Facebook login debacle, we're going to have news and events, we're going to talk about the wonderful Og Camp. We're going to interview two very clever chaps from uh, Ireland who've created several Ubuntu distros, um, including an education one and a lightweight one. Um, and we are going to have the bit about Ubuntu. What was it called before? Uh, G- Norman. Norman, that's the one. Um, and no feedback because it's the first episode of New Season and you haven't written to us yet. So there are five of us here this evening. Four of us have microphones. Alan is looking at me. Alan, how are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. We're in your kitchen again today. We are. Studio B, I think. Yes. How you doing? Well, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I smell flapjack. Do you? Yeah. I can't help you with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to the last month and a half? Um, you know, that uh, I always find it hard to answer that one. Well, actually, no, I don't. I find it really easy because I have, keep a little diary of oh, things right. that I do. Um, but I haven't kept it up to date because we haven't been doing a podcast. It's really stupid, really, because it would be a really massive list. Okay, so I'll talk to somebody else. Dave. But I have. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Suddenly he changes his tune. <laughs> sort your mic technique out. Um, actually, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware, but I haven't actually touched this microphone since Tony did. Sorry, producer Laura sorts it out. Uh, so, yeah, um, I've done a bit of um, tomboy packaging, uh, helping them out, and um, which I've been doing, you know, regularly anyway, just whenever they put new releases out. All oh, so right. It's always useful. Um, installs upgrades oh i'll tell you something i have been doing i gave a talk at um my local lug mm. an impromptu one on saturday and what was it about um it was about i call it tin box tin box distro or something tin like box that. distro mm. i carry around this little um tin, al- box? tin box yeah like altoids tin like the thing you get mints in okay. or something like that and in it i've got a usb stick that's got ubuntu on it and another usb stick which is a 3g dongle and then a few other bits and bobs so if i find myself at a venue where I don't have my computer and I want to use someone's computer, I can just plug the USB stick in because it's got Ubuntu on the 32 gig stick installed. Now, are you using uh, persistent storage on that? No, I'm not. I've just got Ubuntu installed onto the USB stick, just like you chuck a CD in Mm. and then do the install like you do it onto a disk. I've done it onto the USB Uh stick. And so all my files are on it. It's encrypted. So Uh, if I lose the stick... Or the tin. Or the tin... It's not that big. A deal. I'll be more worried about the cost of the USB stick than, than my data and a 3G dongle. So if people say, I don't want to use my network, then I can plug my own 3G dongle in and I'm done. That's sorted. Sounds like a good, good little project. Are you going to release it? There's nothing to release. It's just well, standard Ubuntu. You just okay. put the CD in and install on a USB stick and what, that's it. What about selling tins on the internet? Uh, I think other people have already done that. Okay. All right, I the want date. the mints. That's Actually, what that's I not a bad want. idea. Put it all to, package it all together. It's mm-hmm. like a, an Ubuntu tin. Yeah, I'll take 10%. Um, Dave, <laughs> what have you been up to? Oh, I've, oh, man. Same as Alan. I'm actually really struggling to think of the things I've been up to because it feels like it's been eternity. But um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, um, the, the UK team is now running our own uh, Etherpad in- instance. Which, the um, UK Loco? Yes, yes. Oh, right, okay. Yes, we're... Um, we're uh, Etherpad is... a uh, Gobby or a collaborative editor, mm. um, similar to like Google Docs, so it's multiplayer notepad, no, multiplayer notepad, if you like. But it's a, a web-based version rather than a, a full client yes. version like Gobby, isn't it? Yeah, so you, so you just go to a, um, an address and uh, and you basically can all collaborate. So it's like a real-time wiki. Mm. And um, that, that seems to be quite stable and running better than I'd hoped, to be honest. So have you been setting that up? Is that what you've been doing? Uh, that, that's one of the things. Uh, because they open sourced it, didn't they? So. They, they, they did, ah, right. because uh, Google acquired the company that was owning it, and a lot of people went, well, hang on, you're just going to close it down? Because they were going to move the people into working with Google Wave. And um, uh-huh. and Google, was quite surprisingly, in my opinion, said, no, you can have, you can have the source code. Oh, good on them. So, so that, that's really good. Although I'm a bit worried about the direction of the project. There doesn't seem to be any clear leadership at the moment, and I don't think much is going to get done for the next couple of months. But I, I'm, I may be mistaken. It sounds like you need to step up to the plate. <laughs> Given you're running at least three instances of it. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the biggest consumer in the world. No, no, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Um, so what's the other, some of the other thing? Oh, I've recently, um, I'm taking a break from Twitter. I, I hadn't noticed. Are you taking a break from blogging as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I didn't actually choose to take this break from Twitter. Oh, okay. Um, my account's been suspended ah. due to suspicious activity. It's It'll Quimber, isn't it? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, so, um, and actually, I feel surprisingly shut out in the cold. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how 
in, integrated into Twitter you find yourself. So, so, so that's something I've been doing this week. Okay, so everybody can talk about Davy on Twitter and he won't be able to read about it, at least for a couple of weeks until he gets it sorted out. <laughs> Worth bearing in mind. Simon, how you doing, mate? Good. Good, good, good? Yep. Doing lots of running? He loads. 150 miles this year so far. Wow. <laughs> Get a, get a car. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> move closer to work. Um, so I haven't actually been doing that much Ubuntu stuff. Uh, I've been doing tons and tons of running. But uh, the one thing I have done is um, taken my EPC, uh, retired that to the roof, uh, put uh, Ubuntu server on it. What, on the outside of the roof? <laughs> <laughs> Kick on the outside, no, just in the loft. Oh. And uh, put Ubuntu server on it and Mosquito. And I've plugged my current cost into it. Uh-huh. Uh, I haven't quite got it working yet. I've got data out of the current cost. So current cost is the thing for measuring your electricity usage, yeah? Yes, amongst other things. Um, so it's talking to Mosquito, but I just haven't done anything with Mosquito yet. So it is kind of working, but um, that's about as far as I've got. It just seems it? wrong to have a server on such a tiny... The 701. The 701 brilliant. I know. It draws I know. so I know. little power. I've got a server on a Viglin, but it just seems <laughs> wrong on an EPC. I don't know why. Actually, for the last year, my Viglin, uh, every hour, has been playing the Big Ben tunes. And it's in the garage. So you, you're outside, you hear the duh, 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 duh. And then the dongs for the hour. And it's, <laughs> it's starting to get annoying. I bet your neighbours love that. <laughs> you can't hear it when the door's shut. But. Okay, that's all right then. Tony, what have you been doing? Ooh, um, very quickly, I've been installing Mythbuntu. Um, replacing my sort of hand-built version of Myth TV, I installed it on a, an Aspire Revo. Ah, very popular those things. It's working very well. Yeah, um, still got a couple of tweaks just to finish it all off, but basically it's working well. I'm very impressed with the Mythbuntu control center. It allows you to set up the web interface and password protect it, and do all the bits and bobs you had to configure use configuration files to do when I set my box up the first time around. It's now all point and click. There's a few kind of little tweaks still to go, but you know it's it's much much better. It's, um, how are you getting on with the HDTV through there? Uh, really good. I've got HD, HDMI cable into my TV, and it does audio out over it, and I can... Yeah, it's brilliant. One cable. Job Superb. Done. Yep, and that's about it, really. That's the main are you thing. using um, the NVIDIA VDPAU stuff to do full yes. HD? Yes. Cool. Yeah. It seems to work really well. Yeah, and, and I'm impressed with the picture quality and things as well. And the video codecs uh, all seem to work, and so I can play back the other videos and, you know, sort of... AVIs and uh, not podcast videos, vidcast, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, all seem to work really well. Cool. Um, so I'm very impressed. And it's much quieter. The Revo's silent, mm. practically. Mm-hmm. So it's going to use a lot less power than the old box, and everything will be wonderful. One thing that really bugs me about mine is you can't do wake by USB. Uh, that bugs the hell out of me. I think the power consumption it's drawing, it would just leave it on all the time. 22 watts. Bother. I think I measured it as 22 watts. Mm, that's not much. I think that's about it, isn't it? Should we get on with it? Sounds like a fun-packed show. Thanks, Dave. I wanted to talk about um, an article that has been quite popular recently, possibly too popular for some people. Um, it, was on, it was an article on a popular tech blog called Rewrite Web. And in short, they posted an article, and it was about Facebook, um, an editorial article about Facebook. And the article itself happened to bubble up the Google search rankings enough so that if you searched for the word Facebook on Google, it would come before Facebook. <laughs> and uh, the result of this, that, that they discovered that a lot of people actually get to Facebook by searching in Google for Facebook. Rather than <laughs> typing the URL facebook.com yeah. in the address bar, they type Facebook in Google and then just go bam and hit whatever the first link is. And then type in their username and password and, and, and then they go. So loads of people arrived at this Read Write Web article thinking, oh my God, Facebook redesign looks rubbish. This, this is awful. <laughs> and just hunting around the screen, found a logon um, for Read Write Web and left comments there. And if you read the comments for this article, which we'll link to, there's loads of comments about, oh my God, this is awful. Facebook looks rubbish. Oh, just let me log in already. And, you know, loads of quite, mm. you know, Frust- frustrated people, yeah. clearly, who just wanted to get to Facebook. Now, this raises a number of points. Yeah. And the one that I think is quite sobering is the idea that there are people out there who don't know the difference between a URL and searching and getting to a website and how to navigate the web. But more importantly, this is our target audience for mm. Ubuntu. Mm. And are we ready those people and are we 
are we doing the right thing to tailor what we do for that kind of user? Because that's what they're like. Well, actually, um, things like Google um, Chrome and Chromium actually go some way towards solving this because you've got the the uh, regular websites you go to as your homepage, haven't you? Sure, yeah, but that, that makes it easier for, for beginners. But these people aren't beginners because they know how to log into Facebook and stuff. It's just the way they get into it. Really... Well, and beginners which, in what way? That you said they're not beginners. They're, they're not, not begin- beginners because they've been using the web. They've been getting to Facebook. They've been chatting online through Facebook and doing the whole Facebook thing. But they just don't understand. It's and it's really hard not to be judgmental. And we've spoken about this previously. Yeah. Every time we talk about it, it's stunning, absolutely stunning that that's the way people do things. But. Oh, it's very easy to think these people are idiots or, oh my God, we're scraping, no. scraping the bottom of the barrel if we're looking for people like this. Or, but, but these are just normal people. They are, Actually, absolutely. To be honest, there are some websites I regularly go to by searching through um, a search engine. Yeah, and, and I, I don't, I mean, I do the same thing. Sometimes a you know, complex URL or something that's hard to type or something, I just, I, I know a word. So I'm not saying that that's an intrinsically bad thing to search for the thing you're after, that's what search engines are for. What I'm raising is that these people went to a tech blog and thought that it was Facebook because it was the first hit on Google. And despite the fact it looked completely different, it had yep. different design, it had different color scheme, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't a login page. It was an article on a, on a site. It had adverts in line. It, and it, there was yes. a, a big chunk of text, which is yeah. the article, not... You know, I've just brushed my teeth and, yes. you know, I love, I've got Farmville and stuff like that. But actually, now that's been explained to me, <clears throat> if I actually look at the comments on the bottom of the page, it does almost look like your your um, wall or news feed or, you know, you can imagine how that happened. Well, once those comments have started to accrue, yes. But yeah. for, for the first people going there, the alarm bells didn't go off. The fact that it looked totally different and felt totally different and there was a different URL in, in the address bar at the top. None of these things tip them off that actually maybe I've ended up at the wrong place on the internet somehow. So this whole thing about Ubuntu changing search provider to Yahoo, maybe yeah. they're onto a really good thing because absolutely everyone clearly, and by everyone, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not saying collectively everyone in this room like techies. Mm. I mean, everyone else, the great unwashed, use a search engine yeah. to find everything. So, you know, maybe we're going to get a fair amount of revenue from all these people who just type Facebook into that box. Yeah. And, and a lot of people were saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter. You can just change your search, default search engine if you want to, the whole Yahoo um, uh, canonical deal. Um, but clearly a lot of people won't bother because they don't even realize there's a possibility to change that. Yeah. I mean, this, this shows that, that, you know, we keep saying that, oh, your average user doesn't care about this or your average user doesn't care about that. Yeah. And then you get very opinionated, very... Um, angry people in within our community who get very frustrated by the choices that are made or get very frustrated at, at the design decisions that are made and think that we're dumbing things down. And I'm not saying these people, the Great Almost, are dumb, but they clearly, clearly something that is, in inverted commas, simpler, maybe appeals to them. Well, maybe we need to have a, a sort of a, a more overriding uh, design philosophy for Ubuntu. You've got to have levels of user where you can say um yeah i know a little bit about uh, the you know using the internet Mm. or i'm a complete geek freak and you you should be able to set your user level that's that's quite a good idea serif page plus application no i used back in the 90s used to have exactly that it had three different levels yeah and you could toggle between them and by default it gave you like introductory easy level and it only showed you the most basic tools and when you felt you'd mastered those and wanted to have a bit more flexibility and a bit more control, you clicked and it took you to the next level. Mm. It's like a game within a publishing program. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, or do we just leave Ubuntu and go back to Debian? Well, th- there's a market for lots of different distros. There's a market for the advanced ones. Like, for example, I was chatting in the um, Surrey Lug um, IRC channel just the other day, and there was a guy in there um, telling me how great Arch Linux was. And I said, well, the last time I tried it, um, it didn't, 
um, set a DHCP service um, uh, configuration for me. So when I installed it, it had a static IP address, which was completely useless on my network. And he said, well, yeah, you're expected to change that. The whole idea of the whole philosophy of Arch is it's fully customizable and you are supposed to change every single field to your own liking. Now, that's like the way other end of the, the extreme. But yeah. there's a place for that. But the thing that's, is, that is more the hobbyist. You know, yeah, the totally. person who's using the computer as a hobby. Rather like than, us. Yeah. But but then at, at the end of the stream that, that, that the rewrite web article highlights is a significantly larger chunk of people. And these are the people we're aiming at because these are all the people who run Windows XP. These are the people who, who don't know there's other operating systems out there. They're, these are the people who, who just, when their computer becomes slow, they throw it away and buy another one. They, 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 these are all the, the, the hallmarks of, of, in inverted commas, normal average people. The argument is, should we be aiming towards the lowest common denominator? The, there's some criticism of GNOME. I'm not uh, saying they're low. <laughs> just no, there's no, lots no. of them. But yeah, absolutely. So hence, you know, okay. yeah, lowest in that The common sense. bit. Yeah. Um, there's an argument about GNOME. Some, some people were sort of criticising it, saying that if GNOME, uh, the, the ideal GNOME interface is one button that says, do everything I want to do, and you hit it, and it does everything you want it to do. Mm. Um, and that's actually an ideal solution for for the more general user because it will sort things out for them it doesn't confuse them with lots of extra options and although it was a tongue-in-cheek criticism back at the time simplifying the interface taking away things they don't need um and and hiding stuff that is obviously uh, confusing or at least irrelevant or not just just not looked at they obviously stripped out all of the stuff on the read write web page that mentally just ignored it um should there be a focus in a version of Ubuntu, um, or perhaps the main version? I don't know to to try and really get rid of all that sort of stuff. Well, you look at you look at um, parodies like uh, the Onion had a parody where they showed Mac laptops and it had one giant scroll wheel where the keyboard should be. There was like no keyboard, yeah. just one giant iPod style scroll wheel, and you see these people scrolling to get the letter of their choice <laughs> and then bash the button to choose it. But then the iPhone arguably one of the most popular devices you know in the world at the moment it's got one button yeah on the front of it yeah. it, it, it fulfills that you know i want to go home bonk you press that button and it takes you home i've got an android phone it has two ways of getting home you press the home button and it gets home or you press the back button and it exits the application not if you're using the web browser oh it goes back oh that really confuses me anyway my point being that that They've simplified it, mm. and it appeals to people. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we should be making one giant button in the middle of the screen that says, do everything I want, take me to Facebook, donk. Can we do that within the existing Ubuntu flavor, or would it just drive all of us geeky people to something else? No, because you can set the level. The point is that, um, obviously, the basic user can do with um, a Facebook button on their desktop, um, whereas the more advanced person can just use a web browser. Yeah, okay. And so set the level. You should be able to, I don't know, say I'm a basic user and the basic stuff is there. I'm an advanced user. I can get to the advanced stuff or and I can, in fact, keep the basic stuff if I choose to. But it's not necessarily about being you know, low, medium, high in terms of skill level. It's, it's requir- it has having different requirements. Absolutely. Like you can, some, you someone can, has a set of requirements which is a certain set of applications and a certain set of functionality someone else has a different set of requirements and there's going to be some overlap between them but it's not that anyone is higher or lower than anyone else it's just a different set of the same overall functionality isn't it sure yeah i mean i think i think the key is is it sh- out of the box it should be you know very usable and possibly the features you don't either use very often or most users will never use are hidden i i, I think that's the key and I think that would actually settle for everybody. because uh, Except the KDE users who like to have everything exposed. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I mean, they're starting to go the other way, actually. I, I don't know if you've seen some of the, the latest ones, but they are starting to try and make things a little bit more slick. How well do we think Ubuntu caters for the read-write web comment crowd at the moment? Someone suggested, I was talking to um, someone about making setting up a machine for my mum. Now, my mum's never used a computer, really, like effectively never. And yet she's your mum. How does that work? Yeah, I managed to keep her away. So she's never used a computer. And I I was talking with some friends about um, what I should set up for her. And I I suggested, um, I can't remember which application. Oh, that was it. Someone suggested, well, you should install Wine on there for her just in case there's any Windows applications that she might want. 
And the other suggestion was that is just massively over the top. Mm. You know, you, you, she'll, she'll never, if she doesn't grasp the idea of what's the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web, you know, the idea of running yeah. wine is going to be, you know, mm. orders of magnitude out of her sphere of interest or, you know. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you've got notion of your C drive and notion of your home directory, and I think that'll just confuse. It's not even, it's just the whole concept of running software for another machine, but even the concept of software and hardware is completely alien. And yeah. it just adds so many levels of complexity that just I don't think are necessary. Whereas out of the box, yeah, I think we are fairly simple. But then I I was humbled by watching the the reaction to that Rewrite Web article and seeing how, you know, how... We, I think we have um, very, very high expectations of your average user, much higher than, 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 we re- than are really appropriate. And I think we think other people are like us. And then, well, everyone is like us. And that's nowhere near the case. Well, I mean, what it is, you've got developers trying to think about what the new user needs. And I think um, something Canonical's recently been doing is they've been trying to do user surveys, haven't they? Where they want people who aren't that experienced basically to try and get this outside research. And I, I think that'll go some way towards it. But um, something I was going to say, do you, do you think the user interface of the, um, of the netbook edition, do you think that would actually be more usable to someone like your mother? That was suggested as well. Someone said, why don't you just do the netbook remix? It's great big buttons. It's, you know, it's a lot easier because... If you give them Ubuntu standard desktop, you've got this big blank thing on the screen yeah. and some tiny little things in the various corners. Whereas Netbook, you've got these nice big buttons with favorites and, you know, things that spin yeah. and stuff straight yeah. out of the box. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, or the new stuff that Jamie Bennett showed, the, the Netbook Remix style thing on the ARM platform. Mm. That looks really cool as well. So, yeah, maybe. All right. I suppose for somebody who's never used a computer before, the default Ubuntu desktop looks about as as intuitive as... A, a, cur- a cursor on a terminal, yeah. just blinking. Yeah. Going, what do I do next? What's next? Yeah. Well, I shall let you know <laughs> <laughs> once I've shown it to her, once I've decided what I'm going to show to her. Well, let us know what you think. Is Ubuntu doing the right thing? Should, uh, should we be doing more to cater towards the less uh, experienced user um, than we are? Or are we headed on the right tracks? Send us your emails to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. It's been a long time since I've had to say that. I couldn't quite remember. <laughs> Um, and uh, we'll read out your feedback in the next show. It's the news. OpenOffice 3.2 has been released, boasting faster startup times and better support for both ODF and proprietary file formats. But will it make it into Lucid? Good question. Anybody know the answer? I'm just Googling. <laughs> <laughs> it would seem quite Not logical for it to be, but considering uh, it's the LTS version, so it needs to be supported longer, and I'd imagine 3.2 would have a longer support cycle. Um, yeah. Well, let's give Alan to the end of the news to find out. <laughs> Novell employee Jonathan Pobst has written a paint application designed to be a Linux version of paint.net, which is the popular painting application on Windows. The best bit, it's called Pinter. Now, I hear that and I think pint of beer, but maybe it's pint of milk or something. Know. But it's really good. Has anybody looked at it? No. No, you should do. No, but I mean, a lot of people have said that GIMP is um, is too powerful for the end user. And exactly. um, hopefully this <laughs> goes... powerful. No, no, no. Pat them on the head. <laughs> Send them running. This is too powerful. <laughs> <laughs> this is too well, no, no, to be, to be <laughs> fair, I use the GIMP a couple of times a week and I use it for resizing. Take That's your it. hands off the keyboard <laughs> and step away from the computer. So, so, so hopefully this will um, become... You know, an easier application and more accessible for uh, for the average user. And you can draw rectangles with it. <laughs> Mattel have announced the 100, 125th career for Barbie is the computer engineer, sporting a laptop, mobile phone, binary t-shirt and funky pink glasses. The doll fought off stiff competition from other careers, including news anchor. Yeah, it seems like every geek That's on the funny. planet voted for computer engineer rather than anything else. I don't even know what the other careers were. I just went there and everyone said, vote for computer engineer. So I went, all right, click. Such a sheep. I am a robot. Well, actually, it's quite telling because, I mean, obviously, traditionally, Barbie dolls have had um, quite sexist and feminine roles, you know. Have they? 
They've got 125 really? different... This is the 125th. Okay, sure. okay. Somewhere in there. Davey, read Brit- something into Brit- it. Brit- actually there. Brit- Brit- Perhaps I'm misguided, but I, th- yes. I thought Barbie dolls um, were... Um, dolls? Yeah. Um, Ch- doing women's jobs. 125 <laughs> oh. careers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, I, I think uh, keep digging. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, is I think it's very good that um, that, that Barbie ah, are, 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 try, are, are, are trying to. Yeah, so they've progressed her from kitchen Barbie to um, geek Bob. It's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, it shows equality even in dogs. Laurie, you're a woman. Do you think it's a good thing? <laughs> Don't give her a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I've got there's a thumbs up. Oh. And the news on Lucid and the yes. Open Office uh, 3.2 is... Yes, I can confirm that. In the Blueprint Desktop Lucid Open Office, it says we're going to shoot for using OpenOffice.org 3.2.1 for Lucid. Excellent. And that's the end of the news. Not many events now, uh, because most of them happened while we weren't recording. Mm. Um, just a couple in the schedule. Uh, firstly, the Southern California Linux Expo is on February. 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 Yep, that's a new month. Uh, February 19th to 21st of 2010. And we've got a trailer to play that we've already played before. Are we going to play it again? We'll play it. Whether you've only heard of Linux or if you're an expert, here's your chance to learn more about it at the Southern California Linux Expo. For 2010, Scale has expanded to five speaker tracks. The Expo now includes a beginner's track for those new to Linux and a developer's track for the coders out there. Scale will have over 50 speakers who will cover the latest topics in open source, and the Expo floor will have over 80 booths with both commercial and nonprofit organizations showing off their products and software. The Southern California Linux Expo is February 19th, 20th, and 21st, 2010 at the Westin LAX Hotel in Los Angeles. For more information or to register for the Expo, visit SoCalLinuxExpo.org. Use promo code CAST, C-A-S-T, for 40% off of your registration. We'll see you at Scale 8 Great trainer. Mm. Now, I mean, it's probably too early to mention the next one, but should we mention it anyway? Fosdem. Well, we don't even know when it is <laughs> or if it's happening. But yeah, the, February I'm, 2011? I'm sure, probably. Sure, probably it's a yeah. safe yeah. bet, yeah. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, none of us were able to go this time round, but um, I think yeah. we'll probably try and spend the best for next year. I spent the best part of a year saying we were going to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, went. So if you went there hoping to meet us... Telling and, everyone uh, else that they should go to Fosdem. Yeah, I hope it was good. Over here, do you want to buy this? It's the centre of the open source universe. I picked it up last year in Wolverhampton. Only one careful owner. It's a bargain. Oi! Oi! Come back! Oh. I'm going to have to find something to do with this. Hold on a minute. Yes, that's right. On the 1st and 2nd of May this year, Liverpool is the only place to be for anyone interested in free software, free culture and free thinking. It's the second live OGCAMP event, organised by the Linux Outlaws and the Ubuntu UK podcast. We've taken the mantle from Lug Radio Live and we're not giving it back. The 1st and 2nd of May 2010 at the Blackie, Liverpool. Visit ogcamp.org for more details. Also join us on Friday, April 30th for a special free culture gig. Kick off the weekend in style with some great live music. But you might want to leave your hubcaps at home. We've got news about OGCAMP. Who remembers OGCAMP? Hmm. Uh, what, what was that, Tony? I think it was an event that happened last year. It was a bit of... Oh, you oh, weren't there, were you? You weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> the I, worst was, I was otherwise <laughs> occupied. <laughs> this is true. Busy with, busy with child. Basically, everybody has twisted our arms collectively, and uh, the those of the Linux outlaws, Dan and Fab, and we have agreed we're going to do it again this year. Hey. Absolutely. Uh, it's going to be bigger and better and longer. It's on two days, I suppose just one day last year, because there's no mm-hmm. Log Radio Live, so we figured, hey, you know, let's make the better event the full weekend, um, which is on the 1st and 2nd of May. So not all that far away, about seven or eight weeks weeks away. And we've moved, haven't we? 
Yes. No longer in the sunny, shiny sitting of city of Wolverhampton. <laughs> Try saying that three times quickly when your teeth are in. Um, no longer in Wolverhampton. We're going to the Black E in Liverpool, which is a sort of community arts centre. Uh, and it looks rather funky. We've seen lots of photos. It does look fantastic. Luckily, we've got the man on the ground in the town. Yep. Dan. Dan. Who's he, sorted out a fantastic venue. Absolutely. He's doing... Uh, a huge amount of the work for this one it's fair to say uh, and it's right but the venue is right next to chinatown so there'll be no shortage of good lunches i suspect mm-hmm. um and uh, we've got a media partner who are linux format um so they're our first sort of sponsor really so mm. pleased to announce them go and buy the magazine um and on the Friday night before, so it's a, it's a Saturday and Sunday, on the Friday night before, there's going to be the Rat Hole Radio Show, which is Dan's, um, one of his other shows that he does. One podcast. of his many other shows. Yeah, he's always on the internet. Um, which is a special free culture gig, and it's got some people who, in all honesty, I'm not incredibly familiar with, but apparently are quite big names in, in the sort of indie circuit, or whatever, not indie circuit, sort of, you know. Stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> Alternative music circuit. Um, so you can find out where, more details where, Dave? Orgcamp.org. Okay, what's the event format? It's like? an unconference, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Again, yeah. yeah. What yeah. does that mean? It Which works, means that um, really well we're not time. we're not planning anything. You just turn up and say, <laughs> "I want to talk about whatever." You yeah. get on the schedule, and away you go. And cool. we've got multiple rooms, multiple stages, and it really relies on everybody coming along with something to talk about. Mm-hmm. So, if you've got a little project you've done, or just uh, some thoughts or anything like that, come along with fifteen minutes worth of stuff you can talk about. It'd be brilliant. Or longer. Or longer, absolutely, yes. But, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to spend, spend hours and days sweating into it, I think. Yeah, you don't have to do it. loads of slides or anything yeah. like that. It's just, um, yeah, more ad hoc, the better, really. Yeah. I'm sure we'll be after volunteers to help out as well. Yes. And um, help crew and things like that. So you can email, if you want to volunteer, you can email ogcamp at ubuntu-uk.org. <laughs> so we're talking to Carol and Aradin in uh, Dublin, who... Were, I think you won the third prize in your category at the EBT yeah, Young Scientist. Prize, it was um, in the technology section, intermediate group. Brilliant. Um, and what was it that your project was? Because it was Ubuntu related, wasn't it? It's an Ubuntu based distribution that has a look similar to Windows to make it easy for Windows users to migrate to Ubuntu and Linux in general. Because the problem that we found was. Many Windows users found the Ubuntu interface unfamiliar. That's a, a really uh, a, a good idea. As some um, of many people uh, used it, of many of yeah, you uh, from the first of January this year, there have been about ten thousand five hundred downloads. That's brilliant! <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's fantastic. So, how have you gone about making it more familiar to Windows users? What changes have you had to make? Um, We got rid of the top panel and we added a Windows Start start menu Mm -hmm. and Windows 7 Start Taskbar. Oh, yeah. Have you made it crash? (laughs) No. (laughs) Oh, that's a shame. (laughs) So if I understand it correctly, um, you're basing this off the official Ubuntu repositories. Yeah, it's Uh, based on Ubuntu and you use the regular repositories, except it has all the updates installed already on it. Okay, oh. so and it also has a few extra applications. So um, the customizations you've done, um, how does that work through the upgrades? Uh, well, we currently haven't fully tested it out, but it worked for some users. But for others, um, we found a problem that it just switched uh, back to the default Ubuntu theme. Uh, uh, okay. We're working on getting the upgrade, updates to work. Okay, something that really interests me, um, perhaps it's because of my background, I don't know, but um, what, what's your actual build process? I mean, um, so, so how do you actually sit, set about actually doing this? Uh, well, we started off with getting the applications working, like the start menu, which is uh, based on GNOME menu, and the taskbar, which is based on docbarx, and then we added all the visual stuff, the themes, wallpapers, and... We also added Play on Linux, uh, Wine, and a few other applications on it. Okay, so how did you go about from actually making them customizations to actually pushing them back into an ISO, you know, a CD um, image? We used a few scripts to automate it. Um, it's remaster this. Oh, yes. Remastering tool, and then that turned the whole setup into an ISO. You mentioned, is it play on Linux and Wine and things? Why did you choose those? What did what do they bring to the party? Uh, well, wine, it's uh, a run 
runtime environment that lets users run Windows programs in Linux. Then play on Linux, it makes it easy to install Windows programs, like some programs like Microsoft Office. They need some tweaking and it does that automatically. Is it a All bit... you have to do is just click it and it'll install Microsoft Office. Is it a bit like there's like crossover office in yeah. that regard? Oh, okay, excellent. Um, so what differences would somebody coming from Windows 7 or Windows Vista notice between um, Windows and, and your distribution? Well, first of all, on the start menu, it's um, set up by categories in, uh, rather than just uh, regular folders. It, like, for example, it's set up uh, internet applications, office applications, graphics, accessories. So oh, okay. it's all ordered out into categories. So you've um, done a, a really good job so far. Are you getting much feedback from the people that have downloaded the ISO and how to go? Yeah, well, the people who successfully installed it, uh, they were really impressed and they thought it was very fast. And uh, some people said that it was actually faster than the regular Ubuntu because <laughs> we included the newest kernel version in it. So you were in the BT Young Scientist. Um, it was a fair, wasn't it, with lots of different stands and things yeah. for different projects. Um, I mean, you've, you're 15, aren't you? No, yeah, I'm 15, and then my brother is 13. 13. Um, so did it come out of something that you were doing at school or college, or was it something you were doing in your own time? We were doing it in our own time, at home, mainly, because in school they don't really teach that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's what they I was getting at. They teach the basics, like using Office and stuff. Okay. So how long have you been using Linux and Ubuntu? Uh, we started at the beginning of summer 2008. We decided to get Ubuntu. Wow. Uh, Impressive stuff. We just saw like many videos on YouTube of it, like with the compass effects and all, and we decided to try that. <laughs> yeah. Ah, you see, I thought those videos were a waste of time, but actually, clearly, they've brought new people in. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. And then two months after that, we started work on Zornos. Cool. So, so you've actually achieved quite a lot um, in, in quite a short time of actually being a Linux user, really. So uh, it's, it's quite impressive in that regard. Thank um, you. Is it, is it just the two of you that work on it, or have you had offers of support from elsewhere? Uh, well, it's the two of us, but then some of the apps are made by the community, like GNOME Menu and DocBarX. So of the two of you, who's in charge? Oh, well, I'm in charge. <laughs> is, is that because you're the eldest? We equal amounts of work. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are you actually starting to get a bit of a community formed around this? Uh, yeah, and on our website we have over 300 users. Wow. Oh, wow. Do you want to re- read out your website address so it's, that people uh, know? www.zoran-os.com. So, uh, Brilliant. Where would you like to see your distribution go in the future? Well, we wanted to expand, and for 3.0, which uh, will be released on the 1st of June this year, uh, we're also including a Mac-style look and a look switcher where it easily changes the looks between Windows uh, 7, Windows Vista, Mac, and Linux. That'll please Popey, won't it? (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. So how are you going to go about creating the Mac look? Have you got to start from scratch again, basically? Uh, Well, we've already done quite a lot of it. We've made a new theme, a Mac-like theme. Um, we're using on for the dock, and then we're using a panel applet as well to make it similar to Mac. And so then the actual lock switching application that was uh, developed in Python by us. So what was your, your main motivation for doing it? Was this to explore how far you could go and, how, and to learn new skills in terms of development and packaging and the things that Dave was talking about? Or was it because you have people in, in your life who would benefit from using this distribution? Well, a bit of both. We decided to improve our computer skills and all with it, but also our father, he's a Windows user, and when we showed him Ubuntu at first, uh, he just said it was completely different, so we decided to create Zornos with the Windows look. So you explain where people can actually get the, um, get the CD image so they can actually try that from your website, but if people actually want to try and help get involved, um, how, how would you want people to help? they can like solve some of the bugs like the driver bugs and we have one guy who's uh, making third party wallpapers as, as well for us and oh. then there's some people who are uh, saying they can make a few games for it as well ah nice what, what sort of games then um, well currently we have like a few racing games and uh, we have shooting games but um, they're just saying they can make a few multiplayer games 
Is gaming really important then to you on to see on Linux? Not hugely. Like I'm not a huge gamer myself, but there are a lot of people who would like to use Linux, but um, they don't use it full time because there's a lack of games. Uh, it's the old problem of games keeping them stuck to Windows. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. How many more solitaire ports do we need on uh, on, on, on Linux? Well, it sounds like you're doing some admirable work there, chaps. And uh, sorry, I sounded very British then for a minute. <laughs> very well done there, chaps. Um, I must admit, I never did anything at school when I was when I was at your age that amounted to anything as popular as, as you've achieved already. Impressive stuff. That's yeah. really good. Yes, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for talking to us and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. And the best of luck with the project. We hope to hear about it soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bit of Ubuntu. Is it officially changing name? Yes. Good. It's much better than Eco Bore. Yeah. What was that all about? Eco Bore. <laughs> <laughs> so we've mentioned a couple of times already that uh, Ubuntu is switching from Google to Yahoo for the search. So what? Yeah. How does this manifest itself? In the browser, in the top right hand corner, Firefox by default, but mm-hmm. on the Netbook Remix, it'll be Chromium. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how they're going to do the Yahoo search thing on Chromium, actually. That'll be interesting. Anyway. Uh, the default is Firefox on the desktop and in the top right hand corner the little search box where you might type a search term usually it's got a little G in there for Google well it'll have a little Y in there for Yahoo Excellent. and when you type your search you'll get results presented by Yahoo but not only that it's the default home page as well isn't it well not quite the well it is but it depends on what you choose in that top right hand corner so if you switch it and change it to Google then your home page switches to Google but it's quite telling because, I mean, for many, Google is the de facto search engine for, for everybody. Well, the good news is they can change from Yahoo to Google. So why have they switched? Money. 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 Well, money. it's partly money and partly other considerations as well. Ooh, that oh. sounds deep, dark and mysterious. The money thing I can understand, basically, they've got a revenue sharing deal with Yahoo, mm-hmm. haven't they? So and that... they had one with Google as well. Ah, Presumably a bigger one with Yahoo. <laughs> well, I, I heard there was a fantastic amount of money just for the Google one. So I, I don't know, you know. Yeah, they don't tend to publish that kind of financial information. Point. Yahoo has better algorithms. That's why they're switching. <laughs> well, I search for myself and I would, I would dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> Were you not the top you? No. No. I won't ask who was. Some sailor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving swiftly on. Um, Lucid um, apparently boots very very quickly. Yeah. Oh man, I you've seen this the, in action. Have yeah, you? I saw it at the um, at the local lug. A guy called Andrew G, who um, uh, is a local member of the Surrey Linux user group, he was sat next to me with a Toshiba laptop, and um, I watched it boot from Grub to the logon screen in five seconds. Wow. Now, was, now to be fair, he had a very expensive SSD in it solid state drive yeah. not, not hard drive but uh, still and they're quicker it was super quick yeah no i mean the interesting thing is is we keep changing from from what this splash thing is i mean one minute we're looking at u splash then we're looking at x splash now we're... i think that's only part of the story though that that doesn't explain the full amount of engineering that's gone into making it get from oh the yes start up to the login screen I mean, super quick that that's been one of uh, scott james ram's uh, main tasks for this uh, release isn't yeah it? scott james remnant too yes uh, yes yes and him and him <laughs> i think they're both working together yeah. weren't they the um but he uh but, but something which i particularly like about the new one is also the the the, the, the check disc oh the, that's so beautiful i mean we, we since dapper we've seen sort of some sort of sort of progress of when it's doing a, a check disc but each time it's getting prettier and prettier. And now it actually looks polished. The only problem I have with that is it says checking drive and then slash. Right. Or checking drive and then slash home. Okay. And just the minor amount of OCD in me says, yeah. that's not a drive, it's, it's a, a partition. partition. Actually, <laughs> something that creeped me out just above that, it said it's the letter C. I don't know if yours did that as well. Uh, in brackets. I think that's yeah. probably where the copyright symbol should oh, be. Oh, I was thinking, was oh, is that saying uh, like, you know, hard drive C? I know, I know. Okay. Uh, openoffice.org is being removed from the Ubuntu Netbook Remix. This is for Lucid as well. Uh, that's for Lucid, yes. Why? Because they're replacing it with smaller, less fat alternatives. Okay. Such as Abbey Word and things Numeric. like that. Yeah. Numeric, okay. I believe so, yeah. Okay, I've tried... Uh, is there a presentation package in that suite of um, applications? I'm not sure there is. No. Would, the, you, would you give a presentation on a netbook? I have well, done. 
Actually, it, it, uh, what? Netbook. So are people huddled round a netbook? No, no. 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 <laughs> I plug it in. It's got a VGA socket on the side. Yeah, but that never works. It works <laughs> first time out the box. It's Actually, fantastic. it does make a lot of sense to be able to turn up and do a presentation connecting to a projector via using a netbook. So yeah. that, that's a potential flaw. ARM based Ubuntu will use Chromium as a default browser. That's something we mentioned earlier, but um, yeah. it's actually, I mean, I actually love Chromium and it's come on leaps and bounds compared to Firefox. It's faster. Yeah, in, in every way it seems better to me. Um, um, so I wonder if we'll see that on the next release. I don't know, there's not as many extensions, I guess. Um, it's, I mean, you can use, it's got native support for Grease Monkey scripts and there's a hell of a lot of extensions starting to appear. Still as not well. as many. It's clearly no. all you could want. Is Grease Monkey. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves a Grease That's Monkey. It. And it's completely open source though, isn't it? The Chromium version. It's it's Yep. The, yeah. Wouldn't be shipped on the C D if well, it was. That's what I mean, yeah. So we're not we're not doing anything wrong in that respect. Oh, well, I'm sure we're doing it wrong in someone's <laughs> eyes. Oh yes. The Ubuntu uh, manual project has been created, uh, which aims to provide a beginner's manual for Ubuntu. Mm. Started Ooh. by um Benjamin Humphreys, who's a guy out of New Zealand. Um he started it actually a his own um, project as a as a manual, and then he th- he decided it would be better if it was a collaborative effort, and lots of people got involved. And um, his ultimate goal is to have it on the CD. And ideally, mm. he would love to have it as an icon on the desktop that you can you know just double click, and there's a a manual there for you as soon as you. Turn so, it is this on. like less technical man pages? Then is it? Um, it's kind of like a, a user guide. Like a manual. Yeah. <laughs> is, what's the output format? Is it going to be a PDF, a load of web pages? Yeah, PDF. PDF. Excellent. I know this is an event um, online. Actually, 22nd and 23rd of February, the Ubuntu Manual Project will be hosting a 48-hour event using Learned, uh, one of Jono's apps, hundreds of apps, <laughs> uh, that provides uh, information for both new contributors and existing contributors. Because mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of stuff to pick up, and he's got a very aggressive um schedule to get it ready for lucid so he's um he wants to make sure there's plenty of uh, people who are up to speed on using things so i think they're using latex for the formatting oh, and right. wow. they're using bazaar for version control so you know there's a bit of a, a learning curve for people yeah. and so he wants to get everyone up to speed so they can just get contributing to the manual and not worry about the tools really yeah a 48 hour marathon i mean that's well he's been working on it a while i think that's just more of a sprint more than anything that sounds good and that's the bit about ubuntu Right, that's the end of the show. All done, finished. That was quite hard work. Yeah, a bit rusty. <laughs> we'll get better, I'm sure. More tea needed. Um, okay. Obviously, we need a, a fair bit of feedback to um, beef up the next show. So uh, please do um, head over to the website. We're not going to tell you all our details, but um, our Twitter feeds, Identica feeds, and all the rest of it um, are on the website. Please do go there and uh, get in touch with us. And if you don't know the website, you can Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.